Bonjour film fans! French director Francois Truffaut's 1959 film The 400 Blows was a groundbreaking moment of sort of gritty psychological docu-realist drama that is considered sort of one of the great French films of all time, one of the cornerstones of the French New Wave, and just really a fantastic all-around film. And when Truffaut went to follow that up, he decided to go in a very different direction. And he made a film, Shoot the Piano Player, that is comical and slapstick and then noirish and dark. It's existential and it's silly. It includes all the hallmarks or many of the hallmarks of the French New Wave. It has long takes then sort of rapid editing with jump cuts. It has a non-linear storyline with flashbacks and flashbacks within flashbacks. The mood changes on a dime, and it's also full of odes to Hollywood cinema, past and present, or at the time present, including anything from the Keystone Cops to 30s gangster films to 1950s film noir. And Critics didn't quite get it at the time, and it didn't have the same reception or the same financial success as The 400 Blows, but since then it's come to be seen as equally as good and equally as important. And in this video, I'd like to consider one of my favorite scenes from Shoot the Piano Player and one of my favorite scenes from the French New Wave and maybe from all cinema, and that's the audition. Join me in this episode of Break the Scene. Hi film fans, just a quick reminder that I'm now on Patreon where I'm adding lots of new content all the time. If you like what I've been doing here and you've been watching these vids for a while, why don't you head on over there and drop me a dime. Link in the description. Shoot the Piano Player, as I said, is a 1960 film that was directed by Francois Truffaut with a script by Francois Truffaut and Marcel Moussy and cinematography by the great Raoul Cotard, who I've already spoken about in other videos in this series. It's a film about identity, it's a film about an identity crisis, it's a film about loss, it's a film about the meaning of life, and it's also just a film about music, but not just music, about what is music? What's the point of music? What's the point of making music? Is music um, an expression of the self? Is music an art to be celebrated? Is music a commodity to be sold? Um, and all of these themes and all of these questions are sort of centered on and swirling around in the brain of Charlie. And I don't want to go too much into the story, but a little bit is important for the scene that's coming up. Charlie's a piano player in a bar. He's very good, clearly, and he plays for kind of drunks and misfits. And he starts to develop this relationship, two relationships really, with women who work in the bar. And he's shy, he's a bit of an introvert, and he doesn't talk a lot about himself. But as his relationship with Lena, the bartender, develops, we start to learn about his past. And this is where the flashback and the flashbacks within flashbacks come in. In Charlie's past, he was known as Edward. And Edward was a concert pianist, and he was becoming quite well known. And he was married, and he was in a seemingly loving relationship. And at one point, he finds out that his wife had an affair, and she had an affair with an impresario or agent, which helped get him his early jobs. So when he finds this out, his whole sense of who he is comes crashing down. Because first of all, he finds out that his wife had this affair. He finds out, at least according to her, that she did it for him. And he finds out that his success that he thinks is built upon his talent and his perseverance, the sweat of his own brow, and so on, is due in part to this affair. So he's betrayed by this, or he feels betrayed by this in numerous different ways all at the same time. And 
as a result of the kind of depression that he goes into or as a result of her own anguish and guilt over it, his wife takes her own life. And this is what leads to him eventually changing his name, changing his profession to a certain extent, and, and kind of taking on a new life because he wants to leave that life behind. And there's a whole other storyline that I won't get into too much here where one of his brothers is involved with some, these sort of gangsters or petty criminals and that intrudes upon his life and it threatens to sort of blow his secret identity. It threatens to upend his relationship with Lena and it leads to a lot of the sort of film noirish or gangster picture tropes that I talked about. There's a lot of gunplay, there's a lot of fights. It's, it's very good. And this is part of what changes the, the tone of the film throughout, is that sometimes we get these moments of introspection where this kind of quiet introvert wonders who he is and what his life means and can he ever love again and these sorts of things, while at the same time gangsters are after him, gangsters are after his brother, he gets kidnapped, he escapes, there's gunplay, there's shootouts, people die, and so on. And these are all coinciding in the same film. And this is why when it first came out, people were like, wait, this isn't the little psychological character study that Truffaut makes. This is, what is this? This pastiche. Um, which is part of why people love it so much today. The scene in question is called The Audition, or is known as The Audition. And it comes in the midst of the flashbacks. And the flashbacks happen as Charlie recounts to Lena his life before, his married life and what happened and how he got where he is and so on. And I want to start with the end of one scene and then watch this long scene. And this is when he goes to the impresario who will find out was responsible for his success um, for his audition. And the, the first scene is just meeting that impresario where we find out maybe they met previously. The wife is there. And then the audition, and then a little snippet of the scene that follows. And let's just have a look. Bonjour, monsieur. Je vous conseille le plat du jour. Permettez-moi de me présenter l'Archemille Impresario. Edouard Sarroyan. Je me souviens parfaitement. Vous êtes pianiste et vous êtes venu me voir il y a un an à mon bureau. Oui, certainement. J'étais très pris et je n'ai pas pu vous recevoir comme j'aurais voulu. Je vous prie de m'en excuser. Je comprends très bien. On mène une vie de fou. Vous permettez Je vous en prie. Ces messieurs veulent-ils déjeuner Il euh, faut que je vous explique. Enfin, je vous présente ma femme. Ah, mes hommages, petite madame. Il faut vous dire comme ça, on joue souvent aux clients et à la serveuse. C'est un jeu merveilleux parce qu'il y a toujours deux gagnants. Ah, vous avez une de ces chances, cher ami. Très aimable. Mais je sais rattraper mes torts. Voulez-vous venir me voir dès demain matin à mon bureau Avec qui avez-vous appris le piano Le vieux Zelny.
So we start with this quick preface where he meets Shmiel, and Shmiel's going to turn out to be very important to him for a couple of different reasons. And we find out that he has this playful relationship with his wife right now, and they're very much in love, and that's going to sort of be affected by everything that follows this. Um, but Shmiel, basically, the important part here is he invites him to come for an audition where Shmiel, who's an important agent, might make his career. Um, and so we cut to the audition. And one of the first things that just always interests me about this scene is that I remember it all the time as one continuous take. But it's not. It's two long takes sort of sandwiching this, this dramatic, dramatically edited moment at the door. So first we, we get this long take and it's a tracking shot down the hall. And here Edward, he's still Edward at this point, is listening to this violin music. And he seems entranced by it. He's looking for the door, so he's also kind of confused where am I supposed to be going. But he's somewhat entranced by this music. And then he walks up to the door, we see Schmiel's name, and we get this series of cuts. This is very interesting. This is very kind of new wavy rapid cuts from, you know, close up to medium shot back to close up to closer up. And this is all meant to convey Edward's, it's a mix of feelings. He's confused because he's been looking for this room. He's nervous because he's going to an audition, but he's also entranced by this music. And so as he goes to push that bell or that buzzer, he stops and he decides, I'm going to let it finish. And this is a really lovely moment because it, it gets to that theme I was talking about, about the importance of music. What is the importance of music? And all of, for me anyway, when I watch this scene, all of Edouard's sort of um, self-criticism, all of his nervousness, his anxiety, um, all of his kind of fears about the state of his career, Finally, once he gets to that door and he knows he's in the right place, they wash away as he finally gives in to the power of the performance on the other side of the door. And then the piece ends, and then we get one of the most interesting little cuts, because I think up to this point, even though it hasn't been a long take, it's been filmed in real time. So as he walks down that hall, obviously this is in real time, but as he stands at the door and we get these cuts to his finger, you know, closer and closer to the finger to the doorbell. This is all implied to be real time too. And the music playing with no interruption contributes to that. So there are no cuts in the music. The music is diegetic at this point. And so as we hear the music, we know that this is happening in sort of chronological, linear, sustained time. Then the music ends, and there's an interesting little cut there where she opens the door right away with her violin in the case. So there's an elision there. There must be some sort of elision from the moment the song ends till the moment she opens the door. So this breaks the kind of, not necessarily linearity of the time, but the sustained real time of the sequence. That ends when she opens the door, right? So that's a really important point. And then we get this lovely moment. We've been building up to this audition. We've seen his nerves. We know how important this is to him in his career. Remember, we're in a flashback and he's telling the story, which is also important. So he's telling Lena this story. So logically, we would follow him into the room, but we don't. We follow this unnamed performer as she walks down the hall listening to his music. And this to me is mystical. It's mysterious. It's not necessary, 
it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. This is Edward Charlie's at this point, as he's telling the story. This is his story. How does he know what happened? He doesn't. But the camera decides, or Truffaut decides, Truffaut guard decide, we are going to lead this performer down the hall. She doesn't appear in the film again. She, she has no role other than this. But something interesting happens. She's listening, and she seems to be enamored of the music. So we get a sense from her musician that Charlie, Edward at that point, is good. But then we get another cut. We cut from the hall to outside. Now, this is a pretty normal cut. You know, it, it spans time. It's another elision in terms of her experience. But notice that the music keeps playing uncut. The music here has become extra diegetic or transdiegetic. If you want to know more about transdiegetic music and what I mean by that, I did a whole video on it, which you can check out here. So it seems unlikely that she's still hearing the music. She's outside this big building now. We know he had to walk up the stairs. It's possible that there's a window open somewhere and she's still hearing it. But if that were the case, I think the volume would have lowered, right? So if that's probably not the case. Perhaps she's hearing it in her head. Perhaps as she walks away, she knows that piece and it continues to play in her head. But there's no clear indication that that's what's happening. All we're left with is this moment of diegetic music, extra diegetic music as she walks away. And I think this again says something about the power of music in this film. And then I let it continue to play because the music becomes transdiegetic again in a different way. So it's diegetic as he begins to play at his audition. It's extra diegetic as she walks away from the building. And then we get another cut where we get this kind of montage of his early career as he starts to rise and become known as a concert pianist. And it becomes diegetic again as we see him playing the same piece in a concert. On the soundtrack, there's no break, there's no change in volume, there's no change in the production value of the music. But on screen, it's in the audition, it's in her head, it's performed for an audience. Think about that what you will, but it's a very interesting use of music as a sound bridge, but music as transdiegetic. And it's telling an entire story. And one of the interesting things is that as this woman never shows up in the film again, what is her life like? Like if we could see the uh, Run Lola Run version of this, presumably Clarice, Edward's wife at the flashback, who's still alive, slept with Schmiel to get him the gig. Does that mean that the unnamed violinist didn't get the gig? And in not getting the gig because he did, or not the gig, but representation. Did that improve her life? Because she didn't have to deal with this, what we can only presume is a sexual abuser or sexual harasser. And so her life was better for not having Schmiel as her agent. Or did she, you know, suffer kind of a depression or did it ruin her career? We don't know. It's left open, completely open. There's no indication, as far as I know, close watchers of Shoot the Piano Player, if you have theories about what happened to this violinist, please let me know in the comments. I would love to know what you think. And so this to me is just a one of the great scenes of the French New Wave because it contains so much thematic resonance for the film. It asks questions about the point of music. It asks questions about a career in music. It asks questions about the sacrifices one will make to get such a career. And it also contemplates the meaning of our lives, in this case, a life built around music. And it does so 
in a formally and stylistic way that is intriguing, illogical, beautifully filmed, and because of the sound bridge of the music throughout the two pieces, that seems to just flow as a normal scene, but once you break it down and think about it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. We shouldn't even see her moments, and when we do see her moments, we shouldn't hear the music the way we do. But in seeing that moment and hearing the music that way, it opens up so much of what the film is trying to say about really, I think, a life well lived. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is just one of many fantastic scenes in Shoot the Piano Player. It is one of my favorite scenes. I remember clearly where I was sitting the first time I watched this film and watching the scene. And it, it was during my PhD, so I came to it kind of late. But as the camera started to lead her down the hallway, asking myself, what's happening? This is his story. And I was engrossed in it at one, you know, on the one hand. And on the other hand, I was just mystified that the film would do this. And that to, to be in the hands of a filmmaker who's audacious enough to do something like that and to do it successfully is a wonderful feeling. So go watch it. Just go watch it and enjoy it. And watch a lot of Truffaut if you can, especially that early, late 50s, early 60s stuff. But everything from his career, you will be happy that you did. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is Movie Talk with Aaron Hunter. I'm Aaron Hunter. If you've made it this far in the video, as I say, please hit the like button. More importantly, please hit that subscribe button. Share this video with your friends. Check me out on Patreon where I'm putting up all kinds of new content all the time. And most importantly, keep watching movies.